Hi, I'm Dr. Brant Pedersen, and in this video, we're going to talk about the connection between your sacroiliac joint and the largest nerve in your body, which runs through your buttock and down the back of your leg, called the sciatic nerve. It's a cause of something called sciatica, which can be incredibly painful. But most people don't know that SI joint dysfunction and SI joint instability and fixation, we'll talk about what all of that means, they don't know the connection between that and sciatic nerve pain. So in this video, we're going to help you understand the anatomy, what can go wrong, and then I'm going to give you six things that you can do to help get rid of sciatic pain and help your SI joint work better. Okay, let's get started. So let's talk about the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in your body. When I was in the cadaver lab and in school, uh, the sciatic nerve is about the size of a number two pencil. And that blew my mind because when I was thinking of nerves before I went into the cadaver lab, I was thinking they were all the thickness of a human hair. But the sciatic nerve is quite large and it transmits through the lumbar vertebrae out past the disc down into the buttock region and then down the back of the thigh. It splits then into the rest of the nerves that go into your calf and foot. And it controls the ability for your muscles to move and also the sensation, uh, hot, cold, pain, those type of things, for all, almost all of the nerves that go into your leg and foot. So when someone has a problem with a sciatic nerve, and it's usually because of compression, we're gonna talk momentarily about the things that compress or pinch on that sciatic nerve. But when people do have that, they'll have pain. They can be in the buttock, down the back of the leg, and into the calf or foot. And that pain can also show up as tingling or numbness, and sometimes it shows up as muscle weakness. What are the things that can compress the sciatic nerve? Well, we can get compression where the nerve or the nerve fibers exit the lumbar vertebra. So that can be caused by a herniated lumbar disc or a disc bulge in the lumbar spine. It can be caused by arthritic changes around the canal. It's called the um, intervertebral foramen where the nerve comes out. It can also be caused by spinal stenosis, and there's two different types of spinal stenosis that can happen, central canal stenosis and lateral recess stenosis. We're gonna talk about that in another video, but in general, central canal stenosis will cause symptoms down both legs, and lateral recess stenosis many times just causes symptoms down one leg. But what's really critical to this video and a common cause that is often overlooked of sciatic pain is something called piriformis syndrome, and that is very tied into the SI joint. We're gonna talk about why. But the sciatic nerve, as it transmits through the piriformis, the piriformis is a muscle that is, goes from your sacrum uh, across your buttock and out to your greater trochanter of your hip. And what happens in 20 to 30% of the populations, there can be anatomical variations where that sciatic nerve runs right through the middle of that piriformis muscle. And so when that piriformis muscle tightens down or gets trigger points in it and causes compression there, it can compress right into that sciatic nerve. And that's where we will see symptoms. The great news is, is that with addressing the underlying cause, and if that is the SI joint, addressing that SI joint and any factors that are downstream from that, we can take and get the sciatic nerve symptoms to calm down and relax usually pretty easily having to avoid things like drugs or surgery uh, or injections. So how can sacroiliac dysfunction or SI joint dysfunction lead to sciatica? Well, usually it is through the mechanism of the piriformis. So let's talk about the anatomy here for a moment. Your sacroiliac joint or SI joint is the joint between your sacrum, which is this triangle-shaped bone, and your ilium, which is this bone of your pelvis here. You can see it on the back here and on the front here. That sacroiliac joint is supposed to move back and forth slightly a few degrees every time you take a step. It's the thing that gives you that sachet in your hips. And if you ever watch someone walk with uh, SI joint dysfunction that's fixated, it'll look like they don't move their hips at all. They're just moving their upper body and their legs, but nothing in their pelvis. The SI joint is held together mainly by ligaments on the front and on the back of the joint. And there's one muscle that specifically crosses the SI joint and that becomes a problem when the joint is either fixated 
or too loose and unstable. Uh, that muscle is called your piriformis. The piriformis comes from your lateral hip here. Across here, it runs right through what's called the sciatic notch, sciatic nerve, and goes and attaches to the front of your sacrum. You can see, therefore, it's crossing right through that SI joint. And so what can happen with that piriformis muscle is if this is your sciatic nerve, it will pass right underneath that piriformis muscle, right through the middle of it. And so you can get impingement of that sciatic nerve as it runs through this area and all the symptoms that it could cause down your leg. The piriformis muscle can become irritated in a number of ways and cause compression. It can have myofascial trigger points in it that cause uh, the muscle to be tight and not want to release. It can also have myofascial adhesions that adhere the sciatic nerve to that piriformis muscle, which causes repeated irritation. So in the treatment section in a moment, we're gonna talk about ways that you can help with myofascial adhesions or trigger points that might be in that piriformis muscle. We're also gonna talk about uh, adhesions that form between the sciatic nerve and the tissues that it goes through and something called sciatic nerve flossing that you can do to, to help that nerve flow better and not put irritation or compression into it. It can also be damaged by trauma and trauma can create instability and sometimes fixation, but a lot of times we'll see SI joint instability. Before we talk about specific causes of sciatica and the solutions and things that can be done to help that, I want to let you know that most of the time, I believe that there are causes to people's symptoms. But most of the time, medicine, healthcare is treating symptoms, treatment comes in, instead of treating causes. And if you don't address the cause, the symptom remains, the symptom comes back. The hardest thing that I do in my practice is to discover for each patient what that specific cause of their pain is because there's many different things it can be. And if we address that cause, then the symptoms go away, usually quickly, and they stay away, usually with things that aren't that difficult to do. So I wanna say that if you are dealing with sciatic pain or other type of pain, don't give up. I believe that if you aren't getting the results from working with your provider, that you should look for other providers that can help you out. If you're working with a chiropractor, or a physical therapist, an acupuncturist, your MD, and you're not getting results, just don't give up. Ask family, ask friends, look online. If you happen to be in the Northern California area, look me up, Dr. Brant Pedersen. But the biggest thing is don't give up. I believe that someone can find and address the cause of your pain, especially with things like you're doing right now, watching YouTube videos to try and help educate yourself so that you can better communicate with your healthcare professionals to get results. So, don't give up. You got this. The first cause and solution of sciatica comes from SI joint instability. And there's a video up here where I've gone really in depth into SI joint instability and things you can do about it. But I'll give you a few of the things here. One is SI joint instability can come on from trauma, like a fall onto your buttocks, a car accident, those type of things, creating instability in the ligaments around the SI joint. And when that happens, an SI belt, a trochanteric belt, a Sorola SI belt can be really good at holding those SI joints in better approximation so that those ligaments can heal and that piriformis muscle can calm down and not push on the sciatic nerve. Not all SI belts are built the same. The one I really love is the Sorola belt. Um, there's other good quality ones out there, but I'll put a link down below to the belt that I really like. Um, I've also got a video up here that talks about how to wear and get the most out of your SI belt, because if you're wearing it in the wrong location, too tight, too loose, that kind of thing, a lot of questions that I get about SI belts, so that'll help you understand that. Other things that are important with SI joint instability is to avoid shearing that joint. So when one leg comes forward, one leg goes back kind of in a, in a yoga pose or in a runner's lunge or lunges in the gym, those type of things shear these SI joints and that can certainly take you farther away from your goal of getting stability in SI joints, even though at the time it might feel better. Another thing that is important with SI joint instability is to avoid getting manual chiropractic or physiotherapy adjustments. That would look like you're lying on your side, the chiropractor is putting their hand on your pelvis, 
and adjusting at that SI joint. That creates a shearing motion, so you want to avoid that. That being said, there are chiropractors that are trained in different methods of adjusting. One of those, and this is an extremity drop table, but um, is a drop table. Uh, we set it to your weight here. We cock the table up like this and then it drops down. It makes noise, but it's a very gentle adjustment. Another way that we can adjust that's very non-force or low force is to put pelvic blocks underneath the pelvis in specific positions to help gravity and the person relaxing to adjust. That's used in sacro-occipital technique, also in applied kinesiology. Something we'll use in the office is pelvic blocks, if that seems like the best way to adjust a patient. Another way that you can adjust if someone has SI joint instability is using an activator instrument. This is a tool that puts a small force directly into the joint. It doesn't create shearing, but if we need to uh, you know, help adjust that SI joint, uh, an activator instrument can help. A second cause and solution of sciatica pain can come from irritation of the nerve as it transmits past other structures. You see, if, if this blue is the nerve, the nerve runs past muscles, tendons, joints, actually runs in what's called a neurovascular bundle. And that nerve itself can get adhered or cause it adhe have adhesions that tie it or stick it down to the things that it passes through. The thing is, is that certain structures in your body love to be stretched, like muscles. And there's other structures in your body, like your nerves, that absolutely abhor, cannot be stretched. It causes symptoms, pain, it's bad stuff. So, uh, what can we do? There's something called sciatic nerve flossing. Actually taking that nerve and kind of flossing it back and forth through the structures that it passes by, they can help to make it so that it's not stuck to them anymore and so it doesn't cause irritation to the sag nerve. I'm going to demonstrate here in a moment how we teach our patients to do that, but I want to say that it should never be painful or recreate your symptoms when you're doing sciatic nerve flossing. It should just be that afterwards that someone feels that they can have more mobility without recreating their sciatic symptoms. So here's how to do a sciatic nerve flossing exercise at home. This is one of my favorite ways. What we're going to do is having you lie on your back, you're going to bring your, your thigh vertically here. You can put your hands behind your knee. And then once you're in this position, you're going to take your ankle and bring that all the way back like this. Uh, after we've done that, you're going to slowly extend your knee and you're going to get to a point where you feel a pull on the back of your thigh and maybe even a pull into your calf. And maybe if you have tingling or that kind of thing going down because of your sciatica, you might actually feel that start to happen. What you're going to do is back off just a little bit from that, this angle here, and then you're going to point your toes and bring your toes back. And what you're doing with this motion, in this position, you're taking and stretching and flossing that sciatic nerve through the buttocks region, the back of the hamstrings into the lower leg here. And when you go this way, you're taking that tension off. So that's half of the flossing mechanism. The other half is that when you are in this position, and the nerve is being stretched towards your foot, you're going to take and extend your neck backwards. And when you extend your neck backwards, you take that tension off the nerves in the spine when they're sliding down towards here. We're going to do the opposite with the neck. We're going to bring the neck up as we bring the toes down. Okay, and then we'll do the opposite going backwards into extension in the neck and bringing the foot here. The way I teach patients is this is like we're getting kicked here. And then when we come here, we're looking down towards what kicked us and we're getting kicked by our toes here, and then we're looking down towards what has kicked us. We don't want to go into flexion at the neck while we bring the foot up. We don't want to do that. What I have people do is five reps in three sets. So there'd be 15 total. I have them do that twice a day. You know, sciatica that won't go away many times has its root in something coming from the feet. And we're going to talk about how I sleuth that out, some things that you can do at home or check at home to see if that could be the cause of your sciatica. So it's important to understand this is the lower leg. This is your foot. You have three arches in your foot, a lateral and a medial longitudinal arch and a transverse metatarsal arch. All of them should be supported properly. And some, of, some people have a higher and a lower arch. It's also important to understand that some people have a flexible arch and some people have a, a pretty stiff or rigid arch. 
The people that get in the most trouble have a high arch that is flexible. And what that means is every time they take a step, this medial arch here collapses inward. So they have falling arches. When that happens, when this arch collapses here, the tibia is going to rotate internally like this. You can actually see that happen there with the arch. And when this tibia rotates internally, it'll take the femur with it. That's your thigh bone. And when it takes the femur with it, your piriformis muscle is going to constantly be getting tweaked with every step you take. And as it gets tweaked and upset and irritated, it's going to tighten down and it can tighten down on that sciatic nerve. What are some things that you can do at home to look for, to see if you're having what we would call extended pronation at your feet? And then we'll talk about what you can do if you do have that. One of the things you can find is that you will have, you'll have exquisitely tender points on your lateral calf here, kind of midway or up towards the top. That is because those muscles that are called your peroneal or fibularis muscles, they're trying to stabilize you. Every time your foot goes down, they're trying to stabilize it. Inside of your knee joint, if that is tender there, the inside of the knee joint, that could be a sign of repeated pronation. Out here over your greater trochanter, that where the piriformis is attaching will get tender because of that repeated activation of those muscles. So those are things you can look for on your body that might be tender. Another thing you can do is look to your shoes. So go into your closet, pick a pair of shoes you've worn a lot. And what we would do is looking here, we'd want to see, do we see a difference in lateral heel wear? So I can see on this one, I have a little bit of extra heel wear here versus here, but it looks like I wear them out kind of evenly. If you see asymmetries in the amount of wear, it's definitely something that could be provoking sciatica on one side. And then you can also look on the bottom of your heels and see, do you notice that the wear pattern is even or asymmetrical? Those are things that I'm looking at with my patients to see, do I think that they have a foot problem that might be causing uh, sciatica? Another thing that we look at is put a patient on a foot scanner. We have a laser foot scanner that takes and measures all of the arches in the, in the human foot within the thickness of a hair. Uh, and so we can see, is there asymmetries from side to side or the arches collapsing evenly or asymmetrically? And asymmetrical is really where we end up with problems. What do we do about it? Well, it's important to wear good footwear, but an orthotic, something that supports the different arches of the foot can really be helpful. An over-the-counter option, and I've put a couple of those down in the show notes below. An over-the-counter option like Superfeet can be good if there isn't an asymmetry from side to side. If there is an asymmetry, if you notice that asymmetry, then you want to get to someone uh, that can make you a custom orthotic. In the office, we use foot levelers orthotics. Uh, they're pretty amazing and um, well tolerated because they're not a rigid polycarbonate orthotic. And so they're usually uh, you know, more comfortable for people while still supporting the foot and doing that in a customized fashion. So if, one, if a person's collapsing more on one side, so we'll take and address that as well. Sometimes we have what are called myofascial adhesions that are causing or irritating that sciatic nerve. And also there can be referral pain patterns from muscles like the gluteus medius and also the piriformis that can cause sciatic nerve symptoms. This is an amazing book here, Myofascial Pain and Dysfunction, the Trigger Point Manual by Travell and Simmons. And in here you'll see that they have documented uh, where the trigger points usually are in the piriformis muscle. And then this would be a common uh, referral pattern for the piriformis muscle. So what we can do is go and work on those trigger points and also what are called myofascial adhesions. It's important to understand fascia is the covering on top of everything in your body, on top of muscles. It's called myofascia. And that myofascia allows the 650 muscles in your body to all glide and slide past each other. It's like a raw chicken breast. If you took two wet, raw chicken breasts, they'd be super slippery on each other. That's because what you're looking at there is not the muscle tissue that's encased in a fascia. And so those fascia layers from trauma, from repetitive motion injuries and postural stresses can get where they are stuck together. And so using a tool, this is a Graston tool, it's a form of what's called IASTM, Instrument Assisted Soft Tissue Mobilization. We can get in 
and break up those myofascial adhesions in the area where the sciatic nerve runs. And we usually only have to do a few sessions to get it where we break up those adhesions, help with the referral pain pattern, usually can get it to go away, and also help that irritation along the sciatic nerve. So it could be that myofascial adhesions in the tissues around your sciatic nerve are causing the sciatic pain. Another common cause of sciatica and sciatic nerve irritation can be a SI joint that is fixated or stuck. And that's different than the one we talked about first, instability of an SI joint. If an SI joint is stuck or fixated, that's something that a chiropractor, a physical therapist, a physiotherapist should be able to help you with. And I will let you know that when those type of patients come in, and it's usually from trauma or a postural cause, and we adjust that SI joint, and we'll usually do that manually, but we can do it with those other techniques as well. When we adjust the SI joint with a manual adjustment, usually a person gets off the table and feels tons better. Their sciatic nerve, because of irritation on that piriformis, the sciatic nerve usually starts to feel better almost immediately. That being said, if a patient feels like I feel tons better, but then they, it comes back the next day, they feel like they need another adjustment and another adjustment and another adjustment, then the underlying cause of why that SI joint is getting fixated needs to be looked into. And some of the things that we've talked about in this video, myofascial adhesions, uh, maybe SI joint instability, maybe looking down towards the feet, maybe looking at postural causes. That's, that's where my job comes in, right? Is trying to be a problem solver for my patients. So work with a good problem solver to figure out what is causing you to need to get adjusted over and over so that you can go on and live a life that's fantastic. This last cause of sciatica pain, but it can be a cause of other types of pain, hip pain, low back pain, SI joint pain. This is a big issue, and we're gonna talk about it in another video, really do a deep dive on it. But it has to do with leg length inequality. There's two different types of leg length inequality. There's what's called anatomical leg length inequality, and that is something that comes on uh, that you're born with, something that comes on from a major trauma, or after surgery. Those are things that can cause your actual bones to be different lengths. It is actually quite rare, but when someone has it, it is debilitating. It is a cause that unless it is addressed, the person will not find relief. We can figure out from an in-office in examination, also from getting x-rays, we can tell if a person has leg length inequality that is anatomical in nature. And that doesn't mean that if you've been told you have a short leg or your legs aren't the same length, maybe by a chiropractor, that is most often, the vast majority of the time, it is a physiological short leg, not an anatomical short leg. You don't actually have different length legs, but it might feel like you do. And when you go to the chiropractor, they might even show you that they're different lengths. And then you, they adjust you and you get off the table and they're the same length. That's a physiological short leg. That process is caused by different muscles being too tight. And as certain muscles tension up, it hikes up the hip, making the leg look short on one side. Why that's important is if someone has an anatomical leg length difference, something like a heel lift can make all the difference in the world to that person. And I do not recommend people going and trying to figure out leg length inequality by themselves. You know, if you put too big of a heel lift or too much or too little or on the wrong side or this kind of thing, you can end up with all sorts of problems. But working with a professional and figuring out if you have a leg length inequality and how big of a heel lift you would need, this is like a $15 product here. This comes apart because that allows you to put in different heights over a certain amount, and we usually say three eighths of an inch. If a person needs a heel lift for more than that, we're looking then to get someone an add to the bottom of their shoe by a shoemaker or a cobbler, that kind of thing, that goes throughout the whole shoe um, instead of just putting in a heel insert. When someone has anatomical leg length inequality, a heel lift can change everything about their biomechanics irritation up into the piriformis, the sciatic nerve, and can be a lasting cause of correction that usually is almost instantaneous upon putting the heel lift in there for that person's sciatica. I hope you found this video helpful. 
and I hope that you have a better understanding of things that can cause sciatica and SI joint pain, how the piriformis is related in there. And if you're in pain, I hope that you will find lasting relief from that pain, that someone will help you discover the cause. Until next time, take care.